So a number of Hope folks have returned from a recent trip to Israel, and Elizabeth, my wife, and I had the privilege of being part of that group. And that's the third time that we've done that, and it's just a very special experience. And I have this thing when I'm walking around in Israel, I'm wondering if Jesus saw it today, what would it look like to him? Excuse me. So I think there's some places where it's untouched terrain. There's nothing built on it. There's no real estate development. There's no nothing there. And I have to imagine he would say, yes, that looks pretty much exactly the way I remember it. And there are other places where it's changed or there are buildings now and development and that sort of stuff. So it's a little bit different. So here's a picture because we're going to be talking about the shepherds today. So I took this uh, and this is called the shepherd's fields. And this is one of those untouched areas. Now you can see developments sort of back in the corners on the horizon line. But this is understood to be the field where the shepherds were when Luke 2, the angel spoke to the shepherds. I bring you good news of great joy. It's this field. It was a serendipity that there was like a Christmas tree right in the middle (laughs) of this picture. And I could get it to look like that. So It's like there were shepherds waiting in the fields by night, getting ready to decorate their Christmas tree and an angel. So then I wonder, like, if Jesus came to Richmond in 2022, or if Jesus, a whole bunch of different places, like, and he sees what we do with Christmas, what would he think of it? And... You know, it's always fun. I like driving around and seeing the way people decorate their yards and all that stuff. And like inflatables, pun intended, have blown up in the last like five or eight years. There's so many and they're bigger and bigger, bigger and bigger. And it's fun to see them. I kind of smile. And the ones that kind of like, maybe I'm missing something. It's pop culture or a movie I miss, but it's inflatable dragons. Like I get the snowman, I get the sand, I get the reindeer, but I'm not sure I get dragons and Christmas. Okay, be that as it may, I imagine being on a little tour with Jesus. And we're like looking at some yards together. And um, <clears throat> Jesus, you know, look at that snowman, like, like Jesus from a warm weather climate. Jesus, you, you know what that is? Well, no, 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 but I, I remember it snowed once when I was a kid up in Galilee. And, um, you know, we made snow angels, you know, on the ground. But Jesus, I know, I know, angels don't have wings, but <clears throat> we made snow angels. Okay, so then, like, I'm tripped up with the dragon, and I'm like, Jesus, are dragons? He's like, yeah, it makes sense. I came to defeat the work of the devil. I'm good with that. And... I'm like, well, okay, well, I wasn't even thinking that way. And then there's like, Jesus says, the guy in the red suit with the beard, who who is he? What's the, that's a really long story, Jesus. And so let's, let's go back to the manger. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock at night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood near them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terribly frightened. And so the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born to you, for you, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly army of angels praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among people with whom he is pleased. When the angels had departed from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let's go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came in a hurry and they found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen him, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed about the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, just as it had been told them. So, surprise, 
shepherds. I wonder if you have ever had a time in your life, it's a rhetorical question, but to be honest, I'll be amazed if your answer is no. I wonder if you've ever had a time in your life where you felt like an outsider. Internally, you have all those feelings like, You're not one of us. You're not really accepted here. Sometimes it can be explicitly made clear to you. Other times it's just glances or looks or attitudes or emotions or the way people treat you or the way they completely pay no attention to you. Sometimes this is in social settings. If we think about growing up, I bet almost all of us have one or more of these memories in school settings, at school with certain environments, at school, groups, teams, you name it. Sometimes it's work. Then there are some places where this can get even harder or feel, feel more emotionally painful. Sometimes it's family. You can feel like an outsider in your family. And with Christmas coming up and families getting together, we understand that feeling like an outsider in your own family can be really hard. Sometimes people feel like outsiders in churches. And I can think of a lot of times where I have felt like an outsider and people look at you like, who are you? What are you doing here? And if I could just say it honestly, I hope that it never happens in our church Feeling like an outsider makes you feel lower than or less than. And so, surprise, it's shepherds. The first ones to get the announcement of the birth of Christ. There's a lot of ink spilled and written commentary about shepherds. They were low lowlifes, ne'er-do-wells, and unreliable, and they weren't allowed to be witnesses in court. There, there's a variety of opinions on how much of that may or may not be true, by the time Jesus was born. But what is absolutely sure is that they were disregarded people. They were kind of dismissed as field hand laborers and they were not highly regarded in the culture. You could say shepherds represent the kind of people that don't get noticed. Shepherds are the people with dirt under their fingernails And these are the people to whom God has first made the announcement of the birth of his son. So whenever we brush up against God for who he really is, excuse me, whenever we brush up against Jesus Christ in a personal and real way, particularly in the first time or first few times, Whether you know it or not, you work through internal, emotional, and intellectual calculations, which are, what does he mean to me? What are the implications of him in my life? And you may not have actually thought it and taken those thought threads through the paces, but it is our natural reaction. Everybody does this. It's interesting that God made the first announcement about the birth of Christ to people who were lower in the strata, socially, economically, and so on. And he didn't make this announcement to the wealthy and those of high position. So I was imagining how would the story be different if perhaps the angels did go to people of wealth, stature, or position, And if you're familiar with the Bible or the Gospels, we could perhaps think this might be like the Pharisees or the Sadducees. So the story would go something like this. In the same city of Jerusalem, there was a council convening, and an angel appeared to them and told them, in Bethlehem, the Savior's born. This is all speculation. We can't know. But they, too, would have gone through all the calculations. What does it mean for us? And I think it's possible that the answer would have been not in Bethlehem. And this is not the way we see the rollout. And this is going to cause a lot of problems for us. So, no. So, the shepherds are the ones to whom 
they go. The shepherds will do something with this news. The shepherds will say yes to it. They'll go and see it and they'll announce it and they'll do something with this news. So I remember years ago after I got out of college, I took a job and I was working with a bank in Charlotte, North Carolina and loved it and had great experiences. And for a while, I got into a stream of doing a lot of employment recruiting, particularly college recruiting. So going to college campuses or to MBA campuses and schools and presenting the bank and talking to people about the possibility of working at the bank and so on. And some interesting things happened and I learned when I was pretty new at this. We went from everywhere to community colleges, to Harvard MBA, to Darden, to Wharton, and we kind of covered the range when we were interviewing and talking to potential candidates. I remember talking to some candidates who went to community colleges and interviews would go something like this. Tell me a little bit about your choice to go to CPCC. And the answer would often go something like this. Well, I was hoping to go to Wake Forest or I was hoping to go to UNC or et cetera. And I wasn't really able to do that because my grandmother's health, she had a long illness and she lived at home. And my family needed me to be close to home to help care for my grandmother. My mom and dad are working and we all had to pitch in and try to help care for my grandmother. So I might ask, what was caring for your grandmother like? And this person could choose to give me as much or little information as they wanted to with that kind of question. And when I would talk to a person like that about a job, this person would engage the conversation and answer with a certain approach and a certain attitude that I found very meaningful. Okay, now, <clears throat> here's the risky part. Occasionally, I would have interviews with people who were like Harvard or Wharton MBAs, and we would talk about a job, and they would more or less say, what's in it for me? And I began to see something different happen here. Okay, now I'm going to put a filter on my email this week from Harvard or Wharton MBAs because I know I'm going to hear it. We're in church. Try to embrace the point. <laughs> but this reality did play out on a number of occasions. The point is that often the guy who went to the community college who had a story like this became a much more significant contributor to the company over the long haul. So God goes to shepherds. He didn't go to the well-positioned. The shepherds responded. They said, yes, they went to see, and then they told the news. You see, so much of what's happening in the, just the account of the birth of Jesus is that the character of the kingdom is being revealed. And so here we get a peasant girl who, when she was approached by the angel Gabriel, said yes. When we were singing the song this morning, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here, I thought, in a sense, that's Mary's song. The angel said to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will conceive and give birth to a child. And she said, yes. And her response effectively said, you are welcome here. And that's a very personal welcome. And then it's a manger, then it's Bethlehem, and now it's shepherds. The point is, we see throughout the birth of Christ, I mean, before this kingdom has even come to its place where Jesus is walking around Capernaum and Jerusalem teaching about it, we're learning about the values and the economies of this kingdom. They are so different than our normal valuations of life and of people. And one of the best descriptions that we have of this kingdom is the way Paul describes it in 2 Corinthians 5.16, where he's saying, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. In other words, here's what he's saying. So from now on, believers, 
we no longer regard anyone from a worldly point of view, right? Because we know our Christ, we know the humility of his birth and his life, and we know how God is reaching out to the disregarded people. We know how he seems to work through and move through and particularly invite in those people who are dismissed, disregarded, who the world values more lowly, and the people who the world values more highly, they're certainly welcome in, but they don't seem to be the ones God goes to first. I wonder if it's because maybe they wouldn't listen or because they might not be as usable or because they might just say, you know what, all of this is rather beneath me. And for any person who first comes to address the question of Jesus in their life in a real way, and for me, I remember this intensely when we come to this time of year. It was in December of 1982. So for me, 40 years when I finally waved the white flag and said yes to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But I will tell you honestly, when I first came across this Jesus stuff, the attitude of my heart was, this is beneath me. I mean, this is religious nonsense for weak people. It is painful for me to tell you that truth, but that's the true way I saw it. This is just religious fairy tale-ism for people who need these kinds of fantasies to try to get by. God was gracious to keep beating on the door because when he first knocked, my answer was no way. And so we no longer regard anyone from a worldly point of view. In other words, all the worldly categories of elevating people and seeing them as important and special and wealthy and rich and well-positioned, we no longer do that, right, believers? That's what Paul's saying, right, believers? We don't do that. Why? Because we know that God's kingdom doesn't do that, which means God's character doesn't do that, which means the way of being his people means we don't do that. It means that once we have seen Jesus come in his lowly estate and he will speak to those of lowly estate, we realize now no longer do we put people in earthly developed categories. No more are there ethnic categories, no more cultural, no more do we position people by their money or their job or their status or their, st or their school. Was that an was that an iPad? Yes. Okay. All right. There you go. Um, <clears throat> no longer do we position and value people this way. We just don't do it. But there is going to be a really important and even arresting filter that comes through the life, the birth especially of Jesus Christ. The character of the kingdom is laid out in so much humility that what becomes clear is that the proud will self-filter out. Let me read you a couple of verses here. In Psalm 138, verse 6, it says, Though the Lord is great, he cares for the humble, but he keeps his distance from the proud. How about that statement? He keeps his distance from the proud. And then even a little bit more acutely, we read this phrase, he gives grace generously, James 4, as the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Opposes is an active word. That's strong. He opposes the proud. He will actually make plans so that the proud will filter out. And here's where it gets subtle but really important. The way the whole account of the birth and the life of Jesus come about, the humility that pervades all aspects of the life of Christ means that those who are proud will say no to it. I'm above this. That's foolish religion for weak people is what proud people will say. Pride, as it looks down on another, says in its heart, I am not like you. Humility, when it regards another, says I am just like you. And once we begin to realize why Jesus came into the world, we now understand why we don't look at people from a worldly point of view because we are all exactly the same in our need for the Savior. We are all sinful in need of redemption, and all of the worldly categories make no difference on that level playing field. But here's the thing. The character of the kingdom is such that the proud will say no to it. 
Now, the subtle important point is it would be very convenient, and I've heard this done many times, for the proud to say, I'm not going to worship a God who doesn't take everybody in. I'm going to put that God and all of that stuff beneath me. I'm, a, I'm not doing that. But you see, the thing is, God doesn't send anybody out. God simply presents the humility of the kingdom and the proud self-select out by saying no to it. It's remarkable. It's hard in a way. It's like God has clear conditions for the humility of coming into and living in this kingdom. All the world's conditions, your status, your stature, your school, your race, your culture, your money, your wealth, the way the world would generally include or exclude, that matters nothing. What matters simply is the pride or humility basis of our engagement with it. So note in verse 10 and 11 becomes powerful and beautiful. The angel said to them, it's good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. And that's awesome, right? We love the sentiment. This offer of salvation from Christ is made for all people. It's really important and it's really true. And it's a really nice thought. And then it says, but this, today in the city of David, that savior has been born for you. So you get two things going on here that are both essentially important. This offer of Christ is for all people and for you personally. See, here's where it gets really interesting because if it was just for all people but not for you, if we were proud or wrestling with pride, we'd say, oh, that's fine. I can keep my distance. That's some kind of generic religion and God just sends this word and it's for everybody, but it has no personal implications in my life and makes no personal claim on my life. If it's only for all people, we can participate at a distance. We can go through the motions. We can frankly be somebody who goes to church every Sunday of our lives but has never dealt with Jesus personally. And then we get born for you. And so now he's for all people, yes, and he's for you. And once he's for you and for me, we each have a personal question of engaging our yes or no to him. Now, if it's for all people and not to you, we run the risk of making it generic and keeping our distance. If it's only for you and not for all people, we do what most American Christianity has done these days and we make it all about us and we don't care about anybody else. We sing songs like, Jesus did it all for me. I'm telling you, every time I hear it, I want to say, no, oh, no. Right? And I can, I can tell you, wrestling with that, he didn't do it all for you. He did it first out of love and obedience for his heavenly father. He did it next for the redemption of the whole world. And as an expression of his profound and personal love, he has also done it for you and for me. So this news is for all people and also for you. And we come to our yes to Jesus variously, don't we? One of the things I love about hope is I think we have people kind of all over the map when it comes to questions about what do I think of Jesus and where am I? And I love that. And if that's kind of true for you, you're curious and you're not ready for yes to Jesus, I love that honest engagement. We come to our yes variously. Our stories, our backgrounds, our circumstances, what happens to us in our lives. We might have nowhere near been ready to engage Jesus 10 years ago, but things are different now. You get the picture. Mary came to her yes quite immediately, which is remarkable. The shepherds seem to come to their yes quite immediately. And so this news is for all people and born for you. You know, some people will <clears throat> dismiss religion and in pride just sort of put it beneath us. I have to say, honestly, please forgive me, when I see the coexist bumper stickers on cars, it suggests to me that this is a person who says, hey, all you silly religious people, why don't you just get your act together? I get the concept, I love the idea, but whenever I read it, maybe it's my own baggage, it reads with a rather dismissive, prideful tone, like you've 
foolish religious people. Can't you just get your act together? You see, a lot of people will say no to religion. And I think in our culture, we have this weird schizophrenia with these ideas. Because somebody will say no to this religion idea and they'll dismiss it as silly mythology and then they'll bury their nose in the horoscopes and they'll wonder about what the future holds for them by what they're reading, you know, on page nine in the culture section of the paper. So Jesus, we're told, will come and bring peace. I don't know if you've ever wrestled with this phrase. I've long wrestled with it. The English translations come at it quite differently. Verse 14 is the phrase, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among people with whom he is pleased. Okay, other versions say, peace on earth to those on whom his favor rests, right? Most, many of the more secular Christmas cards will say just peace on earth. So Elizabeth and I were on a website making a Christmas card uh, recently, and it cracks me up because the website says, you know, type of card, and then you click holiday, and then you come to the holiday, you click Christmas. Then you come to Christmas, and it's like type of card, and one of the options is religious. So I'm like, you know what, honey, let's have a Christian Christmas this year. Like, let's do, <laughs> let's do a religious card this year. I think we should, I think we should go for it and, and do a Christian Christmas. All right, I get it, right? It's just my dumb mind at home, but (laughs) so he says, peace on earth to those on whom his favorite, what does it mean? Like, isn't the peace for everybody? Well, it's offered to everybody, but it's only experienced by those who say yes. That's the point. Peace on earth to whom? The offer is for everybody. This strange Greek phrase with whom he is well pleased and all that kind of stuff, what it frankly means is peace on earth to those who say yes to him personally. It's not like then an offer, it's a reality. The offer of peace to everybody is the offer. The reality is that the peace actually starts happening for the person who says yes to him personally. And what does this peace look like? Right? Does this peace mean that if you're a person who says yes to Jesus, the hard stuff that happens to other people won't happen to you? No. Does this peace mean that the emotional ups and downs of life or feeling like an outsider or a stranger and wrestling with your own sense of, gee whiz, where do I fit in and who am I? Does that mean that all of that's gone? No. But here's what it does mean. It means when you face the pain, you have a completely different perspective. You have a foundation to stand on. You have an eternal God who loves you personally. You have a suffering Savior who has come into the world and is acquainted with bitterest grief. You have the one who's experienced that pain and given us the promise of the resurrection of heaven and that this promise is made as an offer to everybody, but the peace of it becomes real for the people who say yes to Jesus. It's the difference now, that peace, between living your life like this And what I mean by this is the white-knuckled grip of the steering wheel of your life that you have to make it go a certain way. I have to make it look this way. My job has to look this way. My children have to look the way I want them to look. My family needs to develop this way. My relationships need to happen this way. My economic status needs to happen this way. My social acceptance needs to happen this way. And that is an exhausting way to live. The option of peace is to go from this to this to be able now to know that you have a God who loves you, who knows you better than you know yourself, who loves you and wants your life to be lived in intimate beauty with him in ways that are beyond we would have imagined when we were doing this. And so he's inviting us to go from trying to drive our life with all the anxieties and say yes. Does it mean that the pain's gone? No. It means that we can receive the presence, the comfort, the reality of the living God who has entered the pain and come and lived a human life in our world. And so it's shepherds. Last week I mentioned that when Mary laid him in a manger, was she calculating that the feed trough would hold the one who would later say, I'm the bread of life? I don't think she was. When she lays him in a manger and has shepherds coming to visit, is she calculating that they knew that a Passover lamb, when they could birth a Passover lamb, would be wrapped up and laid in a manger? I don't think so. 
But it is the shepherds now who will come see him and they'll have a particularly poignant approach. And this is particularly poignant because God calls us his people sheep. Psalm 100 verse 3, know that the Lord is God. It's he who made us and we are his. We're his people, the sheep of his pasture. Surprise, shepherds are the first ones to the birth. Almost everybody has somewhere along the line prayed, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Surprise, shepherds are the first ones at the birth. And how about this beautiful expression from this Jesus, John 10, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for my sheep. We're called sheep in the Bible. On the one hand, it's not very flattering because sheep are stupid. (laughs) And if you're going to be identified with a sheep, you're going to have to be a little bit humble. Sheep are known for being dumb. They're known for getting themselves in situations that are problems that they can't get themselves out of. The shepherd has to rescue them and get them out of this fix. And frankly, the more I read about sheep, the more I'm like, yep. (laughs) Goats apparently are much smarter. Sheep, not so much. And we're called the sheep of his pasture. Surprise, shepherds are the first to be there. And then note that it says, let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what's happened. And then in verse 20, it wraps up by saying, the shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all they'd heard and seen. It's just as they had been told. You see, one of the very important aspects of the Christian religion is that it's a come and see religion. In John 1.39, the disciples said to Jesus, where are you staying? And he said, come with me and see. Like, come on and see it for yourself. In John 4, when Jesus had spoken and released from her pain and hardship, the Samaritan woman at the well, she ran around and told everybody she knew, come see the man who told me everything that I did. You see, mythology and distant religion says, here's a myth, imagine it if you can. Christianity is saying, come and see the truth of it for yourself. And so in Matthew 28, we get the beautiful bookend The shepherds were told to come see the manger and see the baby there. And when the women got to the tomb, they were told he's not here, he's risen, just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Come and see the places where he lay. Bethlehem, manger, animals, hay. Come wounded, come hurting, come broken, sad. Bring question or doubt, bring grief or your wound. Only come humble where he lay, a manger full, an empty tomb. Come see, I'm the God who does what I say. And so the shepherds come, and there's the baby lying in the manger. And before he could speak, he's teaching us. He hasn't yet said a word, but he's already said so much. Let's pray. Lord, we're just so grateful. Even in the mysteries, we're just so grateful. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for coming. For all of us in this room, Lord, wherever we are in our yes to you, would you, Holy Spirit, walk with us and help us through our hurdles? For those who don't feel ready to say yes to you, at least with a clear first yes, would you be present to them, help them with their questions, their doubts, their pain? For us who have said yes, but who still have the places where we're asking and crying out to you, And we say, Lord, we do believe, but help us with our unbelief. Come, Holy Spirit, and help us toward yes. And thank you for people like Mary and these shepherds, men with dirt under their fingernails who said yes. And help us to be like them, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.